Nubar, um, it, it's been so wonderful to hear your updates from you personally over the last few weeks. Tell us what is the very latest. Where do things stand now between Moderna and the FDA? Well, thanks, Emily. Thanks for having me. Uh, yes, yeah, so today was, was another important step along the way to uh, the upcoming Thursday meeting of the advisory committee of the FDA, uh, which will discuss the possibility of an emergency use authorization of the vaccine, which uh, following the precedent that was set last week of the further discussions and review should, should hopefully produce uh, an answer very soon after the meeting. And then after that, we'll, we'll the, the Operation Warp Speed colleagues that we worked with for many months are poised and ready to get the vaccine, first doses of the vaccine out uh, for, for uh, um, healthcare workers and, and more broadly uh, immediately. So we're very much awaiting that moment. So if this is approved by Friday, how many doses do you believe will be shipped in that very first week to the United States? Um, I, I, don't, I don't have the, the very specifics because that's a bit changing as well, depending on what day it is, uh, because we're producing the vaccine as well. But what we said publicly, Emily, is that there will be some 20 million doses uh, prepared by Moderna for shipment in December if we can get the emergency use authorization. So. That's the number that we've been working towards. Of course, a subset of those will go out first, uh, several million doses, followed by shipments, repeat shipments thereafter to fulfill that goal. Now, Moderna has said you could potentially make up to a billion doses by the end of next year. How many of that billion doses do you think, based on what you're seeing in the supply chain, you will actually be able to make? We said that we are poised to make 500 million to a billion doses. Um, under different circumstances, we may be on the high end of that. We'll also be watching for demand. Um, one of the things, Emily, that none of us knew as recently as a month ago, and we still don't know over the next few weeks and months, is just how many of the vaccines will actually get over the finish line, show not only safety, but efficacy sufficient for broad adoption and and that in turn will have a a, a role to play in dictating um, how much volume each of the vaccine manufacturers needs to make and can make so the capacity is one thing the utilization will be another so we've been thinking in the 500 million to billion range maybe in the middle of that but we it's still early for us to determine exactly where that'll be uh, we've, we've certainly made a lot of upfront investments to be in a position to reach those goals should we need to. Okay, so if you can share any more details about capacity then, are there any particular ingredients that are in, let's say, short supply? Or do you have everything you need to get to that, you know, 750, you know, maybe a, a billion doses um, based on what you're seeing right now? Based on what we're seeing right now and the volumes that we've already committed to uh, with our uh, partners, the governments that have already uh, pre-ordered vaccine and that we foresee ordering in the near future. Uh, we have certainly the supply chain in place. Again, let me commend the close collaboration with our OWS colleagues who played an important role in, in securing uh, some of the key items that we needed help with, making sure we get in a timely way. And so I think the, the, the system is in place of course, there may be disruptions, there may be surprises, but right now I think certainly the 200 million doses that have so far been secured by the U.S. government and whatever we foresee for the rest of the world, we're in a pretty good position to make. And, and the key supplies are being secured, have been secured, and as we go along, we may increase those. Your production, which has been an incredible feat, has been watched with great fascination. How has Moderna been able to get such a leg up on Pfizer in producing more doses of a similar vaccine in initial weeks? What's been the secret sauce? Well, Emily, I can't speak to the, the specifics of what Pfizer's been doing, but, but I hold the company in the highest regard, being a, a quite an old established company with vast resources and vast expertise. Um, this vaccine, the messenger RNA vaccine, is something that Moderna has been working on for almost seven, eight years, and the whole technology we've worked on for 10 years. 
And, and as the pioneers in this space, um, as, as you may know, we, we, we spoke earlier about this, uh, we have uh, experience across 10 different human vaccines that we've tried in trials and are currently being pursued for other diseases. All of that, all of the 10 years of expertise, the hundreds of millions we've invested in production, in optimization, all have supported us in what we've been trying to do in a very short time frame, which is to scale what is an unprecedented vaccine. But it comes on the heels of significant technology, process development, analytical investments we've made, among them being how to make sure that we can store our vaccine at conditions minus 20 degrees centigrade that are more compatible with vast distribution than would have otherwise been the case. Five years ago, we had processes that also needed to be kept at ultra frozen conditions down in the minus 70, minus 80 degree range. I'd say that's an important part. The other important part is the people. We're fortunate to have attracted some of the most experienced people in this industry under the leadership of Juan Andres, who came to us from many, many years, if not decades of experience at Novartis. And the leadership he and his broad team provided was in fact absolutely essential for a small company. Usually small companies have less experienced leadership and when put to this kind of test, uh, everything is being done for the first time. Well, here they had done this before in prior pandemics even, right. but simply not at Moderna. Did your work with the NIH and Operation Warp Speed help potentially smooth out the, the process at all, like the onboarding of manufacturing facilities perhaps? Our work with the NIH was primarily in the vaccine development itself, the science underlying the, the spike protein that's been well covered, uh, and of course the, the years of work we've done together on evaluating mRNA as a rapid response technology. Uh, and, and that, that has, has been well described and, and much appreciated uh, by, by us and every single person who will receive our vaccine. Uh, OWS, on the other hand, has been deeply involved in supporting uh, and advising the work that Moderna has done in preparing itself to produce at these scales and to distribute, uh, and, and that has been uh, essential. I, I cannot uh, overstate the central role it played. Uh, General Perna, Monsef Slawi, and their whole organization, I think, played an important role. It's unfortunate that we've been in a rather politicized environment where every single action ends up being interpreted multiple ways. But when you strip all that away, hopefully we'll come out of a political environment relatively soon. What they have done is an essential part of where we are today. Now, what are your plans for unblinding the study? And given, for example, the folks who were given the placebo, the actual vaccine, is that something that would happen immediately? Emily, that's a topic that is being actively discussed, as you may have seen last week in the previous VRPAC meeting. I'm sure it'll be discussed uh, in, the, in the upcoming VRPAC meeting. And that's something that we will uh, determine jointly with the FDA uh, in concert, because what we want to do is make sure, on the one hand, we get the emergency uh, supplies of the vaccine out. On the other hand, we ensure that the proper licensure eventually is granted so that we can broadly distribute the vaccine. And yet we need to take care of considerations that balance uh, what, is, what is fair and ethical for the, the participants of our trial and other considerations. So it's something that will, will yet be discussed and finalized. And as soon as that's determined, it'll obviously be uh, made publicly available. Now, there are some lingering concerns about side effects and reactions. The FDA says it can't rule out a relationship between the vaccine and Bell's palsy. Obviously, this would be in an incredibly rare instance. But what do you have to say to people out there who might have these concerns in the back of their mind? I think the key is to follow medical advice, collect as much information as possible, uh, and keep in mind that any treatment, any vaccine, in fact, much of what we do in life, is a trade-off between known risks and unknown risks. In this case, we have two known risks. Exposure to a virus that has uh, significant and in some cases severe consequences on health, 
or uh, some conditions, some rare side effects that may be seen and have been uh, studied and, and compared between various trials and the placebo groups. And so all of that information goes into the FDA determination, the advisor's uh, recommendations, uh, and then the medical profession looking at all that and making suggestions across the board to their, their patients, their colleagues, and all of that has to be taken together. I, I think it's fair for people to be very thoughtful about this, but in the end, it's not as though we can wish this virus away. We're gonna to have to protect ourselves broadly. We think that a vaccine is an effective molecular mask of sorts. Uh, we, we talk about the mask being uh, the best vaccine. I think pretty soon we're gonna be talking about a vaccine being the best mask in the sense that it's onboarded and it protects us through our immune system. So long way of saying, Emily, I think these are fair questions, but they have answers and they're all in trading the risks of infection and its consequences with the risks inherent in any vaccine, including these ones.